obviously we're talking to Havana Salon. She's a member of the 2019 Jamaican World Cup team um, that participated in France last year. Um, even though they didn't make it out of their group, they did very, very well to be there for the first time. So we're very excited to have her. Um, Havana, thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. And I will pass it over to Ron. He's known you for quite a while, so he'll give everyone kind of a backstory and, and a little bit of a brief bio on everything that you've done and what you're continuing to do. So, Ron, go ahead. Well, thanks, Savannah, for uh, coming out. And uh, I just want to just be the first time actually talking to a former player like this, so pretty cool. Um, I just want to tell the group here, uh, I had the pleasure of coaching Havana, but but – Overall, just want to really talk about her as a player real quick before we get started. First of all, she was a very special player. Um, played at every single level you could play at, um, from club to high school to college and now pros. She played in the professional women's league here in the, in the United States, and then now she plays abroad. I uh, you believe you're playing with parents right now, right? Um, I was. So you were? The, obviously, oh. nobody's playing right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that cut that short. But um, yeah, so obviously she's she's done some really good things, um, and we'll go over some of the things that that got to this point. But one of the most humble players, she won't talk really about herself that much. I was really surprised that she was so eager to do this, <laughs> but uh, but she's a very good. Uh, she's very humble. She, if I had her ability, I would have talked so much smack, but I never once ever heard her do that. So. Um, We'll go into the questions, Savannah, and uh, the very first one, uh, what is the one thing that has made you successful to play at the highest level? What is it, it could be one thing, or do you think it was a multitude? Um, I mean, I definitely think it's a combination of things. I think for me, um, there's two things that I think have kind of helped me continue, um, and one is just a mindset. You know, I think that we train physically, obviously, day in and day out. And I think as I got from club to high school to college to the pros, um, it was the mental aspect of the game, I think, that I kept going um, from a standpoint of believing yourself because you're going to play for a lot of equipment. And I think that's going to be one of the hardest parts is – you know, in club and in high school, your coaches have a bit more investment in you because they're coaching you for four years or they're coaching you through shows or international. And they build a standpoint for me to not be there. No. Um, and the second kind of got me here is to just keep going. You know, I think um, they sort of has their own story and when they start when dot. Um, for me, I love when I always have so like has crossed. Um, and that's not to say that it hasn't been stuck, but I think for me, um, through high school and even still now, uh, I love what I do. So kind of a no brainer. Yeah. So you came to me as a scrawny little freshman, and um, I just, but it was probably the 10th grade when I realized, man, this girl, she's the player. She's going to be special. When did you this game? When did it first really hit you? Um, I think, well, it's funny. You say, like, that's when you realized that you thought that I was going to be special. And I think my 10th grade year was when I realized how much I loved the game. Um, I played tennis growing up. So I was always playing two sports. I'd never really chosen. And I believe it was my 10th grade year where my mom said, hey, like, it's time. You, you, you both, it's time to pick. Um, I actually picked tennis first. And then two months later was like, like and so it's not so much when I realized the sport hold on Havana. i think just we're like, losing you a bit we're losing you just a little bit we lost you a little bit were you good you're bad good. okay yeah um, the, okay go ahead yeah 
I guess I guess my out. question would be I guess my question would be okay when did you know I, I know you in tenth grade and for a fun that me and Havana both beat her sisters in tennis we uh but yeah, anyway he, but <laughs> yeah the um when did you think you know you were going to be more than just you realize you're going to be just more than your average player that you're going to be able to go on you know when did you think when did you realize that maybe you could play at a florida and and then and, yeah. and, and on from there um i mean maybe be late bloomer um i was never one of the like young ones called into national team camps you know ahead of the crowd i felt like i was so as club went on when the college um looking for colleges came around i was a bit game as well um and then when i was in college um was on par again i would say you know i had a successful call I didn't even watch the draft. I was didn't expect to get drafted. Um, and in my mind, it had been made. I was going to play professionally. Obviously, it makes that easier. But it wasn't like I am special. It was sort of like kind of goes back to my mind. The decision was made that I was going to keep going. Um, and still, I, I don't think that I've kind of reached my peak. Um, that's scary you know. <laughs> but um yeah so I mean it's hard to say when I was I was special because mm-hmm. I think for me I've always felt um in my story yeah well I would tell the group here that you know I you play with a lot of really good players and even in clubs like you played alongside Morgan Bryan and a lot of players that got a lot of hype um I wouldn't necessarily characterize you as a late bloomer. I would just say um, players are more put themselves out there more than you in, yeah. in, in terms of like that, but, but like ability just from the little the side of, of soccer that a lot <laughs> of players don't. Yeah. Um, so, Danny, you want to ask the next question? Yeah, so, Havana, just talking, you know, leading in is, to say what kind of experiences how do you feel your club career um whether it was getting you know, alongside someone like morgan bryan um, in big time tournaments and how do you feel like your club um career kind of got you where you are today yeah um i mean i was really really fortunate i had two amazing coaches um and i think they laid the foundation for me to become the player that i am um my very first coach was Mike Walker and I played in Jacksonville um and he just kind of taught the fundamentals of the game in such a you know and some uh, people would probably argue it's the boring stuff you know um but to me I think that he set a foundation that allowed me to adapt as the levels um and I think that was the most crucial point I also think that um like I said in club you have coaches who believe in you so I think there's a trust there so when you're having an off day and like he would lay into us it was like he wants you to be your best you know now as it progresses and you have different coaches and the investment is what can be really dip handle that um but for me one you're in such a like safe environment from a standpoint of trying things, from learning, from connecting with people. Um, and I think time where like learning should be embraced and like failing should be, be embraced. You try to do something to expose yourself to like, work on the things that maybe you're not very good at Mm -hmm. you know and I wish that back in the club days like for me defending has never been one of my strongest assets Um, Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of times I put myself in situations to where I never had to work on it you know Mm -hmm. and 
looking back, I wish I could go back to those environments. Competition and the trust and all of that is there so I can could grow in those areas. But I also would love to be like 13 again, 15 <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, um, so, so I know there's a problem there's outside the obvious, like, like in just physicality. But what do you th think face from going to club soccer and then going to UF and then going to international level and professional level? I think one of the biggest, and every school is different, but for me, going from club to college, there was just a level of grit. Um, there was a level of competition amongst us, which in a good way, but we as teammates like pushed each other to be better. And like, if, if you take my spot on the weekend games, like you take it because you earned it. Um, and it was just a very competitive environment. You know, everybody wants to be successful and everybody wants to be on the field. And I think it's been a long time since I've been in club soccer, but the every, every love based on performance. If game time comes and you don't perform, then game time, you don't have as much. So I think college soccer was, was kind of owns your life, you know? the amount required are like endless so if for me fortunately i experienced um so it wasn't like a no gator a punishment or a, a, yeah, or a negative thing to have to be constantly training with your team um but it's different time requirement and i think when you get into the pros um the biggest difference is the fact that you're still going, which some kid people do, but um, like time on your hands. So if you're a professional player playing in the NWSL, you train from training starts at 10 to 12. You've got to be there like 830. Then you have the rest of the day to yourself. And I think I'll struggle to find a purpose in that. And I think it's hard to when soccer becomes like your source of income and becomes like every part of your life or to find the balance in that, I think. Danny, good, next one. Yeah, good, good. Which actually leads into the next question, Amanda. What we've got some, some obviously graduating this year. They haven't had a spring season. Um, we played one game, I think it was March 7th. Um, so they've been shut doing things on their own. But what advice we you give going to college next year to play what what should they be ready for what should they be prepared for um just some insight on on you know going through that process yeah um you know i think there's i'm sure a lot of anxiety going into that i remember my freshman year even though i'm from gainesville F, which is in gainesville um mm -hmm. it's a big change um not only soccer but life um and I think freshman year, there's going to be a lot of growing pains in whether that's like learning to manage yourself and your time. Um, I think in terms of like preparation, I think a huge part for me looking back is self-belief. Um, I think it's get to a place where you're tested, that you know that you are sure of that. And that being said, I mean, I'm 27 and been playing in the pros for six years and there's still moments where like, I do doubt myself. So that's not to say that you need to be like steadfast and like, oh, I will never right. doubt myself. But it's about understanding that like, hey, you gotta believe in you because if you don't believe in you, why should your coach, why yeah. should your teammates? You know, and I think you, sometimes we expect our coach and our teammates to believe in us before we believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in reality, it's the other way around. Yeah. You know, and I think you got to be ready to work. I mean, college, like I said, it's a big time. I'm committed, not in a scary way and not in an intimidating way. Is it a lot of work? Because um, if you enjoy training, then it's going to be you do, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But um, 
I really do think that trying to enhance the mental side of it um, is a really big part. Yeah. How is how did you feel that your fitness level? I know a lot of players that are leaving club and going to college, they get their their summer workouts and they're they're worried about their fitness level. Is it going to be where it needs to be? Where did you feel uh, that your fitness was, and was it an eye opening experience? Or hey, maybe I'm not as fit as I think I am, or maybe you were fit. Um, yeah. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, training has always been a enjoyable time for me I've always been really good at managing my own fitness Mm -hmm. um that being said I remember getting my summer package for Florida and I was like dang what is this (laughs) um and the way that I train personally is just very different than the way that Florida wanted me to train Mm -hmm. um and I think what's important and it's I think a lot of you guys are probably still too young to know this but what's really important as you go through college from a fitness standpoint is understanding what works for you and starting to learn about, Hey, like, does my body do better when I do 10, one twenties or when I do a two mile run? Cause it's very, very different and players are all unique. And when you go into a big college program, you're going to be put into, you know, one workout that everybody does and yeah, you're going to have to do it. But I think as you you know, progress through your college years, it's important to understand what makes you your best for game day Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to not be afraid to speak up and communicate to the staff about that. Um, I think from a fitness standpoint, it's not, it's going to be the load more so that's going to be hard because, you know, I know I didn't lift a whole lot in high school, um, but like lifting and running are incorporated and scheduled like weekly uh, depending on what school you go to so I think I think the best way to prepare yourself um is to spend this time learning what makes your body feel best you know and and I think a really hard concept for a lot of people sometimes is that like less is more Mm -hmm. if you go out and run 10 miles every single day you're probably not gonna be the fittest you've ever been Mm -hmm you're going to be really worn down and you're going to be really injury prone. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's um, reaching out to people who maybe have more knowledge about that side. It's about, uh, you know, trying different workouts um, and making sure that you are doing what's good for you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, Havana, I saw a lot of goals being scored by you lucky me on the sidelines during high school and a lot of brilliant goals but obviously uh I want to know uh or explain to us how after scoring a goal in the World Cup how did how did you feel at that moment um you know I honestly after see when I like watched the goal back I have a hard time getting into that headspace. I think I was at a point in time, um, the whole road to France in general was a very uh, new experience for Jamaica, to say the least. Um, So there was some growing pains. So I think that game was a very emotional game. Um, And so I didn't start the game. Um, I started the first two games and then I got benched for the first half of the last game and was not super happy about that decision but that was what the coaches decided and then at halftime we were losing 2-0 and they told me I was going in so I think go like I went in right at halftime um and I definitely felt this buzzing you know like I was like I got 45 minutes left on the stage and I never know if I'm going to be here again um but it kind of was a very quiet moment I guess if you were just if I were to explain like what was going through my head it was nothing um and you know after the game they said you know the stadium erupted and I was like I didn't hear anything you know for me it was it was silent and and I remember my teammates and I remember I remember my teammate picking the ball up and I remember thinking I better go but you know there was no there's no thought there was no you know everyone's like oh did you mean to play it back post behind the two running players blah 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 blah, blah. and I was like 
none of that stuff went through my head. You know, at that point in time, my body is just like, it's not like it's on autopilot, but it's like, you know, I've been here before I've trained this before. Um, and it was just a very in the moment kind of experience. Gotcha. Now we obviously had a chance to talk, uh, not too long after that. And I asked you, and I told you, and I just want to know if it's, if your answer to this, when did you realize that, that you made history? Like that, that <laughs> was something because I remember talking to you and your your typical humble self, and I was like, um, you know that you've done something that no one else can ever do again. So when did you, when is that, has that sunk in yet, or? <laughs> um, for me, that moment, I can't say it has sunk, sunken in, I guess, um, because for me, the whole journey was not really about that, yeah. you know, I think, I think Jamaica is a really small country and I think women have very little um, respect in that country. I think the goal allowed Jamaica and women to have a little bit of respect, you know, and I think for me, it's about my teammates and it's about the, the girls growing up in Jamaica right now who are like, Oh, like we can play soccer too, you know? So when I think about like, oh, you made history, I don't, that doesn't like root really well with me. Um, you know, and people ask, you know, like, what does it feel like? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> the goal, yeah. but um, to me, it's not about making history with scoring a goal. Um, it's about making history for make us. Yeah. And just like a greater purpose than that. Yeah. What, uh, for everyone, that, what is the record? I mean, for ones that don't know what the record was, was what was it? What, what made history? Well, I was referring to the fact that, um, you know, people, they, they can uh, acquire dollars. You're not going to be the first person to get a million dollars. There's going to be someone that's going to be... Um, the first person to invent the, the light bulb. No one else can do that ever again. You know, so my point was no one's ever going to be the first goal to like her name is similar in history. And I expect what Havana says, and she's right. Um, those are things when she's old and fat like me, which she probably never will be. But <laughs> uh, but you can you can think back to times. It is special, but I do understand your overall purpose um, and being a role model, that's fantastic. And, uh, I do believe you when you say that, uh, that you have that you kind of, for Jamaica, you, you felt, um, that inspiration for that country and the young girls. So I, I commend you on that. For yeah. Sure. I think it's, I think it's um, great. It'll go down in the, in the record book, you know, which is fine, but what the goal meant, uh, Havana, and you, I think you said it perfectly. If, all of the younger girls that hey we can we can play soccer we can yeah. be Jamaica's first World Cup and and they had not qualified in years previous and I think it means a lot of hearing from you what do you and not that it's being made history yes uh, it, it's what it that message sends out you know I can I can get there as well you know so yeah it's really cool. the thing is too is really cool is like uh i know we have a lot of girls on here and and uh like you know they, they don't realize or maybe they do like you could have been sitting here right with you know like you were in their same position they are and they all have the same opportunities to find a way to make those things happen uh, if they want them like you did yeah so danny want to ask the last one yeah, just kind of, we talked a little bit and touched on it a little bit earlier, just in this crisis together, and we're, we're sending things out uh, to, to the basis of things to do at home. What are you doing specifically? What does kind of your workload look like, or maybe day, day on, day off, day on, day off, but what are you doing during this kind of pandemic to, to stay healthy and to ready to play whenever this uh, we get out of this? Yeah, so for me, 
um, way that I'm, te- I'm in my mind, I'm in an off season. Mm-hmm. So the pro leagues usually run from March to October. Um, and then typically in that downtime, which is about three, four months, I come back to my family in Gainesville and I do a lot of training on my own. Um, so like right now for me at the track and at soccer my off season, it's usually probably 70, 30, 70 running and lifting and 30% mm-hmm. soccer. Um, at that point, my soccer is just kind of on maintenance mode, um, making sure I'm still getting my foot on the ball. And then I'm usually at the track three times a week. Mm-hmm. And then I'm usually at the gym four or five times a week. Um, but I think what's hard resources. So I'm really fortunate Gainesville. Uh, um, I've been able to get on fields and I've been able to get on the track. And my stepdad um, has a gym hard for a lot of people is you know what do I do if I don't have all these things um and I mean my answer would be you're always gonna have a soccer ball and running lifting obviously like I said I'm not sure Mm -hmm. how important that is but if you can run and if you can play so you know I think like that's really really important because you can't do team stuff you can work on the individual things that you as a player need to work on you know and I talked about earlier about um the fundamentals and like the stuff like the boring stuff um and I think that this is a really good time to work on those things yeah yeah lots of depth yeah any uh you did you see any questions in Seen anything on chat yet so no one's really typed anything in so if any of you guys out there have a question ask Havana just go ahead or um, or they can just unmute themselves and ask the question yeah you can unmute yourself it's just if 20 of you all do it at once we could run into a little bit of a traffic jam but if you do have a question you can you can um, ask the question Uh, my last question would be be what 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 did you take away what was it like playing at a world cup i mean it's the beach was it the 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 you know the trips to the stadium was it riding the bus was it the hotel was it walking out onto a beautiful field and seeing fans and i mean what did you really take what was the age yeah um you know i think the the first time that it really sunk in was the first in the national anthem Mm -hmm. um you know up until then I think so much going on that you know everybody's sort of in their emotions and training and traveling and um I I remember standing on the halfway line and the anthem playing and just like looking out into the crowd and I was like wow like I'm at a world cup you Mm -hmm. know and I think there was a moment there at the very first game where that hit me. But then I think after that I into work mode and I was sort of like, all right, mm-hmm. that's great. I'm here. But like, now what, you know? So I think for me, the experience in the moment, um, I think it's really hard to appreciate it because I think that it can take away from why we're there. You know, and I think for me, the appreciation almost came on my like nine hour flight home from France, you know, when I was sitting there kind of replaying games over in my head. Um, I think that's when everything kind of started to sink, you know, because I think it's we, you know, as soccer players, we dream of different goals throughout our whole life, playing club, I mean, playing college, playing pro, going to a World Cup, going to an Olympics, you know, these are like, whether you have like written these down and like believed in them, they are the, the like the pinnacle of her, you know? So I think for me, it was very um, hard to articulate, mm-hmm. obviously. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was, it was unreal. surreal. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then I got, yeah. um, forgot to ask this question. I, I, I know, um, I don't know why I forgot because this is kind of plays an important part to uh, people out there. Um, I know 
you make things look easy when you play the game, but I know it hasn't been easy all the time to get where you're at. You've had to go through some adversity. So what are some of the adversities, the things you've faced, and how did you overcome them? Yeah. Um, so I would say there's two biggest adversities in my career. Both of them involve sitting on the bench. One of them is for injuries, and one of them is just because the coach didn't think I was ready. Um, my junior year in college, we were playing in the SEC championship game, uh, I guess, against the a and And it was in this first half, and I had a non-contact turn and tore my ACL. Um, and up until that point, most of my injuries had been rolled ankle, had nothing long, nothing extensive. Um, so I remember that really kind of rocked my world at the time. So I sat out for a spring semester, recovered, and then had my senior year. And I think that's partially why I didn't watch the draft because I knew my ACL. Um, and in my mind, I was like, I don't want to be, you know, playing professionally is what I want to do. And, you know, if there's no validation through the draft, like I'm still going to show up to someone's preseason camp. Um, and then I got drafted by Seattle and then I signed a, my first pro contract. And then two days later, I broke my leg. Um, and the break in my leg was a spot fracture. So they had to put a plate and screws. Um, and it was about a little over a year recovery. And I think that one was much more difficult because I, so my senior year, I definitely like recovered from ACL, but I was 10 or 12 months out. So I wasn't like back, back physically, you know, the doctor cleared me, my knee was good, but I wasn't mentally back to where I wanted to be. So I think setting setback a year was like, whoa. And it wasn't a year of like, when you tear your ACL, um, hopefully nobody has, but if you have, you know, it's surgery and then you're on crutches. And then, you know, rehab starts. I mean, when I broke my leg, I was on crutches for four months. And um, I had had two different surgeries to get the plates and the screws, like, in. Sometime. Um, it's very difficult because in my mind, I was like, okay, I rehab back to the highest level. Like, talk about starting over from ground zero. And I eventually rehabbed it back. Seattle um, didn't have a great season. Um, I, I mean, I scored my first professional goal, but other than that, I didn't get a ton of minutes. Um, and then I went to the Spirit for my third year and had a really good season. Led the team in goals and assists. And play two games the following oh I think the hardest part in both of those you know I talked about self-doubt earlier you know and I think whether my injuries like my self-doubt was like am I going to be able to come back the same way is it worth it because I've been sitting on the couch for a year while um but I think that's when I was just like once again it was a little bit of a test of my love of the game um because there was definitely moments in there where I felt very far away from the game because in the pros, you're not as close to your team. So not only was I not instantly feel like I was a part of a team, um, was long and really lonely, you know? So I think there's a lot of time when I was sitting there and I was like, is it, is coming back going to be possible? Um, and it's hard to debate with, which is harder sitting on the sidelines when you can't. So, so my second season at the Spirit was really difficult. Um, not only did I only play in like two games, but we lost 12 out of 24 games. So it's not like the people on the field were performing either. So it was a really difficult mental uh, challenge to show up to training every day, um, knowing that maybe not going to make an effect on if I'm going to 
Um, and I think either way, whether and you're or you're sitting on the bench, and you, I think that taught me more than being on the field. Um, I think we can see a lot more when we're on the sidelines, whether it's watching our teammates being there for them because when you're watching you can see somebody struggling you know you can see someone getting called out by the coach seven times at training because you're not playing you know so I think when I was in college and tore my ACL sitting on the sidelines helped me become a better teammate because I was like yeah I'm struggling right now struggling I'm sitting on the bench and I'm seeing my teammates who are struggling with different things you know so I think um from an injury standpoint, we see the game from the outside. Um, and then sitting on the bench when, you know, my coach didn't think that I was uh, – I think that that was when I was like, I really got to believe in me because, like, he clearly doesn't, you know. But, I mean, I think those have definitely been my biggest obstacles. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have one question here. Uh, it said, did you talk in process and how did you get noticed by UL? Um, man, that was so long ago. I was going to say, do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that? I think, um, you know, I, I was definitely going to the college showcases. Um, I was fortunate because I lived in Gainesville um, and Becky my best was actually friends with my stepdad at the recruiting process she had asked me to come visit no I need to get out of Gainesville like UF is not an option and I visited a few other schools uh, contacted me because they had seen um at throughout club soccer uh, and the t the schools that reached out, the ones that I was interested in, I went and took a visit, and Becky said, you know, come visit Florida, and I was like, Becky, no, I don't want to go there, going because my mom said, you know, at least you have something to go, just like it'll literally be a fifteen minute drive. So I was like, okay, fine. Um, and honestly, for me, the biggest decision maker was the coaching staff. Um, I think, you know, every school, they have the beautiful soccer field and they have the gyms and they have all of these nice things. But I think that your college coach or coaches are going to be, yeah, that's one of the most important things is how, how is the relation, what kind of coaching style do they have? Um, what kind of players are they looking for? Or do you fit that? Because everybody's going to bring something a little bit different. Maybe you're super fast or physical. Maybe you're really technical. Um, and different schools have different uh, desires. You know, that's how they want to play. So I think it's to the way a coach wants you to play, opposed to going somewhere where they maybe they're the most technical team in the conference and you're the fastest person in the world your speed isn't valued for them you know so I think that's also really important when you're getting recruited that it's that yeah like they're reaching out to you but it's also important that when you go and you ask these questions you know understand the type of soccer they want to play and understand the kind of player that you are nice. perfect well I don't have I don't see anything else that's coming through the chat um again we won't keep you too long it's a Sunday night so we uh, really appreciate you being on to hear kind of your insight and your thoughts and kind of where your career path has gone. And we're rooting for you for, for the next World Cup for sure. So um, you'll still be in your 20s, right, before for the next World Cup? Uh, maybe just past the 20s, the <laughs> <so> next one. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding with you. So um, I'll pass it over to Ron if you want to finish up, and then we'll uh, we'll keep it while everybody leaves the meeting. and and just see if you have any questions for uh, Savannah. Okay. Savannah, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, ladies, I uh, appreciate you coming on and listening to Savannah speak. Uh, trust me when I tell you that um, if you have the mindset
that like command some of the things she she's done, and uh, that's what it takes. So uh, we'll let you guys get in talk. So ladies, good night. Have a good and uh, stay safe.